Steve Gooch and I have been given the assignment for this session, more effective pulpit preaching. I must say in the beginning that the term pulpit preaching is not a favorite term of mine. I don't consider myself to be a pulpit preacher. I don't even have a pulpit today. We, uh, <laughs> uh, we tried to get one and, and it didn't work. I don't preach to a pulpit and my preaching and my evangel uh, being an evangelist is not limited to what I do standing up there on Sunday morning behind a podium. So I much prefer that we just say a, a gospel preacher or a preacher or a minister of the gospel or an evangelist, and I hope we can eliminate from our vocabulary in the church pulpit preacher, please. Let's just get rid of that term because uh, it's really not descriptive of what an evangelist ought to be. I think it's our definition is, is far too limited when we uh, use the term pulpit preacher. So just say one of the evangelists or the evangelist or a gospel preacher or a minister of the gospel or a proclaimer of the good news or whatever, much better than pulpit preacher. Uh, but I want us to look first of all this afternoon at the role of preaching. Turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 in verse 14. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how, they, how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That passage of scripture gives a very exalted view of preaching. In our day and age, uh, preaching has been sort of put down many times. In fact, people say, well, don't, don't preach to me. Uh, don't, uh, don't preach at me. I don't need a sermon. We do need sermons. We do need to be preached to. Preaching is very important in God's scheme of things. And you go back and look at the great sermons uh, in the book of Acts, for example. And, thank you. Great. And you'll discover that preaching played such a, a major, significant, and important role in the early church. And we need more preachers of the gospel today. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. We need teachers. We need Bible study leaders. We need people serving in every area of the Lord's work, but we need men who know how to preach the gospel. And we need to restore the, the exalted view of preaching that we find in the scriptures. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. In Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about the role of the evangelist in a congregation in the Lord's ministry. In Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 11, it says, Now he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the full measure of perfection found in Christ. The evangelist has a, a key and significant and important role in preparing the saints, in equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And that's what we're going to be uh, concentrating on in our class this afternoon. I want us to look, first of all, at some of the essential elements of preaching. And if you'd uh, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul, in writing to a young evangelist, a young preacher of the gospel by the name of Timothy, says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. This is, a, this is serious business that we're talking about. The charge I'm about to give you, Timothy, is a, is a serious charge in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead. This is, this is a life or death matter that we're discussing here. I give you this charge. Preach the word. Essential elements of preaching. Number one, preach the word. You know, it's, uh, it's so sad, but in so many churches today, not just denominational churches, but even in churches of Christ, you can go and hear everything except the Word preached. And what our world so desperately needs today is the faithful proclamation of the Word of God. The thing that Students, for example, uh, have said to me over and over and over again who grew up in some other background religiously and then attend our services, the thing they say over and over again is, you just preach the Bible. You just, you just preach the Word, and, and that's what we've been looking for, and that's what we want, and that's what we need, even people that don't know that they need it. Need to hear the word of God preached. And that's why Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. And brothers, you just can't improve on that. We need to bring in personal illustrations. We need to, to use things that are happening in our world today as uh, uh, appropriate illustrations in our preaching. But the thing we must focus on, the thing we must center on, the thing that our, our sermons must be filled with is the Word of God. Preach the Word. Or uh, we might paraphrase this and, and, and put it just a, a little differently. Let the Word preach itself. You see, God's Word is the most powerful, the most effective thing that there is in reaching a sinner. There will, there, there, there's nothing that will reach into a person's heart and life like the Word of God will. Now, we can draw home certain things by certain applications of illustrations and principles, but nothing's going to get through to people like the Word of God. Preach the Word. And brothers, I'd just like to hammer that point home today that we be sure that our sermons, that our messages are filled with the Word and let the Word preach itself. Uh, I want to tell you just a couple of things uh, as Chuck introduced things. Uh, we'll never have great churches until we have great preaching. Uh, there are a lot of essential elements in building a great church. But uh, uh, many times we can have fruitful and effective ministries without a strong uh, preaching uh, ministry. I don't want to say a strong pulpit. We've already blown that word out the, out the back door. But we've got to have it. Uh, and uh, we've got to have it from us, from this group. It's got to be great preaching. Uh, and Chuck said we need to preach the word. And uh, I agree with that. Uh, in Acts chapter 14 and verse 1, the Bible says that Paul and uh, uh, Barnabas went to the synagogue and they spoke so effectively that a great number of people believed. And uh, I think as we preach the word, if we're going to preach it effectively, we've got to continue to follow the guidelines that Paul gave Timothy here in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He said, I want you to convince and to rebuke uh, and to exhort, uh, and that uh, we need to meet the needs of our congregations. 
uh, to apply God's word uh, in an appropriate way to appropriate needs in order for that word to have the impact that it needs to have. Uh, otherwise, uh, the word isn't going to touch the hearts unless we uh, uh, approach those needs in the right way. The word of God is the sword of the spirit, but uh, we have to wield that sword. We have to know where to put the sword. The, the Word of God is a sword of the Spirit. But the role of the evangelist, the role of a preacher, is to apply the sword, to put the sword where it needs to be placed. And that's what Steve is, is saying here, that we've got to preach in such a way that the needs of the people that we're speaking to uh, are met. You know, there's a philosophy today uh, among some people that let's not really worry about... Uh, Who's going to stand up in, in, in front of us and preach? In fact, why don't we just let different men in the congregation uh, preach, you know? Whoever feels like they'd like to, to have a shot at it, you know, we'll let this man preach one Sunday and this man preach one Sunday. And, you know, that attitude, you show me a great church with great results that does not have great preaching. And I don't know where we came up with that idea. Certainly there is a place for mutual ministry in the kingdom. But there's also a place that God has placed uh, for the preaching of the word by a preacher, by an evangelist. And we don't need to apologize for the role that we have as an evangelist, uh, as a preacher. Here in this passage, it says, first of all, preach the word. And then it says, be prepared in season and out of season. Be prepared in season and out of season. To me, that uh, phrase carries with the connotation of being consistent. Being consistent in our preaching. You know, I think anybody who calls himself a preacher can probably come up with two or three uh, good sermons. In fact, uh, somebody told me that what most preachers do is they come up with 52 good ones and uh, they preach the, the, their first 52 their first year, they rework them and preach them again the second year, and then they move the third year. And, uh, you know, so many times that's sort of been the way it is uh, uh, in the church. But it ought not to be that way. It says, be prepared in season and out of season. Be consistent in your preaching. Both... Uh, how you preach, and in meeting the needs of the congregation, consistency, uh, all the time, whatever the circumstances, whatever the situations, be consistent in preaching the message. And then he says, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Where it says here to... to uh, correct, to rebuke, and to encourage. It really says to me that there has to be the, the proper balance in our preaching. I've known uh, preachers who could get up and really rebuke a congregation. I mean, they were great at rebuking a congregation. And yet, uh, they didn't know how to encourage a congregation that needed to be encouraged. And I've known preachers that could get up and, and really encourage everybody and make everybody feel real good when maybe they needed to rebuke the congregation. It takes a great deal of wisdom to know when to do what. It takes a great deal of wisdom. It takes a great deal of prayer. It takes a great deal of, of counsel with people that you value uh, their input and what uh, they feel the needs are in the congregation. It takes uh, knowing the congregation and, and knowing what their needs are to know when to rebuke, when to correct, when to encourage, and to have the, the proper balance uh, in your preaching. Um, I don't want to ever get the reputation of being one kind of preacher. 
I don't ever want to get that reputation where when people think of me, they only think of, of one as, aspect of my preaching. I want to preach in such a way that people know that when I need to, I can lay it on and I can rebuke. Uh, when, I, when I need to, I can really encourage people and, uh, and, and give them a sense of, of confidence and trust and hope. And when instruction is needed and correction is needed, then I'm uh, skilled enough to know how to administer that correction uh, through the Word of God. And I think all of us ought to strive to be that kind of preacher that has a balance in the kind of preaching that we do. I don't know how many of you are preaching full time, but uh, that's kind of hard to do when you have to preach twice uh, a Sunday, 52 weeks out of the year. Uh, sometimes you wonder, what am I supposed to preach about? And, uh, you know, what can I preach on this week? And I, I don't think it's a matter of just coming up with something different uh, as much as it is really being in tune with your congregation and, and having, as Chuck said, people to rely on. Uh, I probably, over 50% of the time, I rely on, on my co-workers, on uh, Sam or Skip, uh, to help me to determine what we need to address uh, on Sunday morning or Sunday night. Uh, and they'll give me great input uh, into what to preach on, and I, I couldn't do it without them. And uh, I don't think very f many ministers can really be in tune to the congregation 100% of the time. There are things we're going to miss. Uh, that we're not going to be aware of. And uh, if we're going to be great preachers, and if that word is going to be effective, then we need to be humble enough and open enough to ask for people's help. And what do we need to hear? What does the congregation need to hear? Uh, what do our visitors need to hear? And uh, then get busy uh, on applying the word to those needs uh, uh, on Sunday morning or Sunday night or whenever. And I think encouraging feedback from uh, your members and, and from the people that you're closest to, encouraging feedback from them. If, uh, if you are getting your message across, if your preaching does have the kind of balance that it needs, encourage that feedback. That means a great deal to me. When, uh, when I get positive feedback and people are saying, man, that's just what I needed. That's just what my visitors needed today. That message just really... Uh, was on time. It was really on target. See, that's encouraging to a preacher, and it, it makes you a better preacher. And as painful as it might be, it's also helpful when people in the right spirit, and that's important too, but when people in the right spirit would come to you and say, Brother, I feel like uh, here was a need, or I feel like you, you came on way too strong here, or uh, uh, we needed some encouragement today. Uh, right now, in this congregation, I feel like people are working hard, but, but they're not seeing results, and, and they need some encouragement, and, and I feel like you should have addressed that, or I feel like you could address that. See, encourage good feedback. Now, not everybody's going to always be as perceptive as you might be. They may think that there's one need, when in reality, there may be another need, but it never hurts you to get that feedback. And it never hurts you to, to weigh and to evaluate uh, the feedback that you do get in preparing your messages. Uh, one of the translations, I'm not sure uh, which one it is, maybe the RSV uses the word convince uh, here in this passage of Scripture. And certainly a vital part of preaching is convincing. A vital part of preaching is convincing or persuasion. Uh, Steve has already uh, given you the passage there in Acts chapter 14, verse 1. Look in Acts chapter 19. Uh, sometimes uh, preachers, sometimes Christians are accused of, of mind control. What we're really uh, trying to achieve is uh, a change of mind, uh, a change of heart uh, through the message, through the Word of God, bringing people to the point that they change their hearts, they change their minds uh, toward God. And here it says in Acts chapter uh, 19, uh, beginning in verse 8, 
It says, Now Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Arguing persuasively. We need convincing preaching. We need uh, preaching that in the, the best sense of the word, arguing persuasively. In the very best sense of that word, we need preachers who are able to argue persuasively from the word of God, from the scriptures, to change the hearts and the lives and the minds of those who are in opposition to the will of God. And then over in chap chapter 17 of Acts, in verse 2, it says, As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and there on three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. Paul was able to preach in such a way that they were persuaded. Their minds were changed. He effectively reasoned and proved from the Scriptures. Now, if you take a debate, you realize that you can prove just about anything you want to prove. But he proved from the scriptures. His argumentation was authentic argumentation. His argumentation was ethical argumentation. And his argumentation was argumentation from the scriptures and from the word of God itself. And we must be sure that our arguing and our persuading uh, is from the proper basis and never from any kind of improper basis, such as we see uh, in the world at large, but always from a, a proper basis in the arguing and persuading and convincing about God's Word. Uh, I believe that God uses men uh, uh, to reach people. Uh, that certainly God's Word is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, and yet... Uh, God does work through us, and that doesn't mean we take the glory. He gives us the ability that we have and, and the talent. Uh, and that we uh, uh, need to do more than just lay the facts out. Uh, anybody can read God's Word. Uh, there are a lot of people in the world who have read God's Word, but it has never pricked their hearts. It has never gotten in there and touched them and moved them to make a decision based on it. Uh, and as Chuck said, we need to, to approach it from the proper basis, on the basis of God's Word, but not be ashamed to appeal to people to make the right decision. Uh, I think it was Agrippa said to Paul, you, you, you think you're going to persuade me to be a Christian in such a short time? Paul said, I sure hope so. I'm not ashamed of that. I'll do whatever I can possibly do to get you to make the right decision, a solid decision. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. And uh, frankly, you know, most of uh, our many sermons are just flatly boring. And uh, don't let that ever be said of our pulpits, of our preachers, that people are bored. That we need to persuade men. We need to do whatever we can do to allow God to use us to reach their hearts with God's word. Uh, and to be convincing in those ways. I mean, put our hearts into it, uh, and, and people will listen. But don't be afraid of just going for it, trying to persuade him. I think we've all seen uh, maybe abuses of that, where the, we'll sing the invitation song 20 times, and the preacher will walk the aisle and grab people by the arm and drag them down, you know, and all that. Of course, there are abuses of that. But I don't think we've used it properly enough. We've been afraid. There's more to it than just laying the facts out. A computer can do it. But we're not computers. We're out to reach people's hearts with the Word of God. Amen. And I think that when you look at the ministry, the preaching of the Apostle Paul, Paul was a man who got 
next to people. He got into their hearts. He got into their lives. He, he affected them by his persuasion, by his uh, preaching the word. He, he got next to people. He got through to people. He communicated. And brothers, uh, let me just underscore and say amen again to what Steve just said. Don't back off. Don't be afraid of the proper use of persuasion. In fact, I think we need a lot more of it uh, in the pulpits today. A lot more persuasive preaching. Don't be afraid to get the proper emotions uh, into your message. In fact, how can we dispassionately preach the gospel? And, and just coldly uh, lay out the facts, you know, and here, here it is. If you want it, come and get it. Uh, you know, we need to persuasively put the Word of God out there before people and urge them to make the decision. Uh, nobody believes any more than I do in counting the cost and in being sure that people understand and know what they're doing. But brothers, there is a time and a place when people just need to be urged encouraged and exhorted to go ahead and do what they know they need to do. And don't be afraid to persuade people to respond to Jesus Christ upon their readiness, of course. And I think just to inspire our congregations, I don't think that our congregations as a whole can be moved in any other way than through our preaching. Uh, to, to move a congregation uh, to repent or to work harder, or to be encouraged as a whole. It can be done in no other way than, than through preaching. That, that's where it's going to be done, to inspire and to move the masses. Uh, and God has given us the tool of preaching to do that. Back in 2 Timothy 4, and Steve and I, in putting this class together, wondered how on earth we were going to do it in an hour, and there's no way we can do it, but we're going to try to get as much in as we can because we have so much we want to say to you uh, today that come out of our experience and out of, uh, of uh, both our successes and our mistakes and uh, out of a, a careful study of, of God's Word on this particular subject. Here he says that we're to correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Great patience and careful instruction. People don't change overnight. Congregations don't change overnight. Great churches and great ministries are not built overnight. And he says, you've got to have great patience. Be persistent. Keep on keeping on. Keep on preaching the word. Keep on rebuking, exhorting, correction, but just do it with great patience. Now, patience and tolerance are not uh, synonymous. It didn't say just accept everything the way, the way it is. Don't rock the boat. Uh, just sort of go along with things the way they are. That's not what it says. But it does say use great patience in your ministry. And that's a hard lesson learned. I mean, most of us want it to happen immediately. Most of us want it to happen overnight, right now. We preach it and we want to see all these immediate changes and all these immediate results. But most of us don't really operate that way. It takes that careful instruction. It takes that great patience as we just keep on doing what God has told us to do. You know, in this uh, area, there are several things that I want to talk about in this great patience and careful instruction. Uh, sometimes preachers commit atrocities in the pulpit. They, they haven't heard what it says here about careful instruction. And sometimes we get sort of uh, carried away, I'm afraid. For example, sometimes uh, in, the, uh, in the presentation of our message, 
we will uh, get into some areas where we really don't know what we're talking about. And we'll start telling all these historical facts and all this historical data that is totally incorrect. And if you happen to have a professor of history sitting out there in the audience, and you're up there telling all these historical facts, he's not going to believe anything else you say either. If you're off base on that, if you're off base on that, your lie will be off base on some other things. Or you start speaking on scientific matters and you don't know a thing in the world about what you're talking about. And all the people out there that are science professors or getting their degrees in, in a scientific field say, man, that guy doesn't have any credibility. Listen, listen to what he's saying. You know, uh, I've heard all my life a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, and I think that is so true. Uh, I don't think uh, that every Christian has to be a, a Greek scholar or a Hebrew scholar in order to know and to obey and to follow the Word of God and to be an effective Christian. I don't believe that at all. Nor do I believe that it would even be feasible or, or possible for every Christian to get a degree so he could uh, study God's Word out of the original language. In fact, there are very, very few people that can do that. So we have to depend upon those who are scholars and who have devoted themselves to this type of work to uh, uh, give us translations that are that are good translations and that are uh, accurate translations of the Word of God. But brothers, just because you've taken two or three courses in Greek, don't get up there and present yourself as a Greek scholar. Uh, don't start, uh, you know, using all of these arguments from the Greek, you know, when you just barely made a, a B in the course anyway or, or, or whatever. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's better just to, just, to, just to stay out of that area altogether. Just stick with English. Really. Just stick with English. And if anything, if you want to quote somebody who is a scholar on a particular passage. But I think we really destroy our credibility when we start trying to speak in an area where on a scholarship basis, we're not qualified to speak uh, in that particular area. And I would just like to warn us about that. Um, use good research. When it talks about careful instruction, do your homework. Do good research. I mean, you know, really, it's an imposition to stand before people and to preach to them for 45 minutes when you haven't prepared for that message. When you haven't done the research that you need to do. When you're taking 45 minutes of their time, then they deserve something from you. And they have a right to know that you have prepared your message. That you have prepared from the study of God's Word. That you have prepared through research into to reference books that relate to the subject that you have uh, prepared through your own prayer life to be able to, to preach that message and to communicate that message. So uh, uh, good research, good preparation is so important. Uh, also, I think uh, those of us who preach must be very careful when it says careful instruction that we use good exegesis when we are preaching the Word. Uh, I've, uh, I've done it, I'm sure, and I've seen brothers do it, make a point out of a particular passage of Scripture, and it might be a great point, but that's not what that Scripture says. It's not what that Scripture says. It may be a great point. You just use the wrong Scripture with it. It's the wrong Scripture. I heard... Uh, Ruba Shelley, in fact, last Sunday I was in Nashville and attended where Ruba Shelley preaches. And 
he uh, said uh, uh, a Bible major, uh, I won't say which college it was at, but he said a Bible major was looking for a scripture. He was sort of a legalist, and he was looking for a scripture that would entitle him to uh, give this young lady that he was very much uh, attracted to a passionate goodnight kiss. And so finally, uh, he found it. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And so he went and, and he talked to the Bible professor, obviously. I mean, he wasn't going to just run out and do it, you know. So he, he went and talked to the Bible professor, and he said, uh, what does this verse mean? And so the Bible professor said, well, and he explained what the holy kiss was in the scriptures. And he goes, oh, no, well, that doesn't qualify. I can't use that scripture. So he went back and he, he gave her a, a great handshake and a warm hug, and he took off, and she just, you know, two minutes later, ran up to him, grabbed him, gave him this tremendous passionate kiss. And he said, do you have a scripture for that? She said, yes, I do. The Bible says, whatsoever you would have men do unto you, do unto them. <laughs> now, brothers, uh, that's poor exegesis. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, you can have a great point, but you can get your scripture uh, from the wrong place. You can use the wrong scriptures to try to prove your point. And uh, let's, be, let's be faithful in our preaching of the Word. Let's be faithful in our proclamation of the Word and not in any way uh, use the kind of, of uh, arguments or poor exegesis that would really discredit uh, our preaching. Uh, if you do very much preaching, uh, I think it's easy to, uh, to get lazy and to use the same material over and over and over. And as uh, Chuck's saying, that can be very boring to your, to your audience. And uh, I think it, uh, it means that if you're going to be uh, a full-time preacher, you're going to have to study the, study the Word. You're going to have to hammer it out and, uh, and develop your own material. And uh, I think many times we, we use a lot of other people's material. And uh, frankly when that's what the majority of our sermon consists of, it's going to lack a lot of punch. You're just not going to be able to present that with the same sort of conviction and confidence and firmness that you would have if you developed it yourself. And uh, we need to do our research. We need to take advantage of other books and, and commentaries and things like that. But, but guys, let's just don't regurgitate, regurgitate the commentaries. Uh, let's take the time to study hard, to hammer things out, to have a great understanding of God's Word, to continually be having new insights into it, to give our messages the freshness that they need to have, the careful instruction, the preparation time. Uh, Abe Miller, uh, who will be speaking at the uh, Florida seminar, told me one time, he says, uh, inspiration in presentation means perspiration in preparation. He says, you've got to sweat it out. If you're going to have a message that is going to inspire and move people, it's just going to take a lot of hard work and careful preparation in order to do that. You know, it says preach the word, not steal the word. And uh, I think we need to learn that lesson, you know. We're to preach it, not steal it. Uh, it's, it's, it's very uh, disturbing, you know, sometimes you go somewhere and you get up and you preach a sermon. And after so, with you know, everybody comes in. That was a great sermon, you know. Uh, so and so gave that, you know, two weeks ago. Uh, same sermon, amazing, same points and everything. And uh, you know what happened was he heard that you preached it, and uh, so he went and preached it there. And then you came along, not knowing that he had stolen your sermon and preached it, and you preach it, and well, it's embarrassing, uh, you know. So don't steal the word. Just just preach the word, brother. I want to say just a word to you about the use of personal illustrations. And examples. Uh, I really need to bear down on this, I think, because I, I, I've seen what I consider to be some very inappropriate things done. Um, it is very inappropriate to get up in a sermon and tell some uh, intimate account that someone 
uh, told you in a counseling session, and here you're sharing it with a whole congregation, and if they've got a half a brain, they can figure out pretty quickly who, the, who you're talking about. You know, we should not carry our personal counseling sessions uh, into the pulpit and relate them in such a way that it destroys uh, confidentiality and, by the same token, destroys credibility. Another thing, it's, it's very kin to this, some of you brothers, I'll put it that way because I'm looking at some of you that have done this, uh, you, you come and preach a great sermon, and in the course of the sermon, you tell some illustrations. You'll say, for example, uh, I was talking to a man uh, just three weeks ago by the name of, and you give his name, and uh, he's been running around on his wife, and he's been, you know, and, and so forth, but he's really searching. <laughs> And I, and I just know that he's going to become a Christian, and I want you to be praying for him so he will become a Christian. Now, you've just, you've just told everybody there what old, you know, so-and-so's problems are. And when they finally see him and he introduces, oh, you're the one, yeah, you know. <laughs> Brothers, don't give inappropriate details, uh, people's names and situations and circumstances from the pulpit. Uh, that is inappropriate. And uh, that kind of thing just, just ought not to be done. And yet, uh, I, I see that being done, and it's, it's embarrassing, and uh, I don't think it's the proper use of the pulpit uh, to do that kind of thing. You can give illustrations without calling people's names or without giving such, such details that it's very obvious and very apparent, the uh, persons that you're uh, referring to. Well, we must have great patience and careful instruction. Then, in this passage, it says, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine, and said to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. We must preach sound doctrine. And the word sound there is more than just uh, the idea of, of, uh, of biblical, but it also carries with the connotation of being wholesome, being good, sound, not only biblical, but that which is wholesome and that which is, is upbuilding and that which will do us good, sound doctrine, sound teaching. And I think in this connection, I just need to say that in the midst of our rebuking, in the midst of correction, instruction, exhortation, admonition, warnings, in the midst of all of that, brothers, Preach in such a way that you leave people with a sense of hope. That you leave people with a sense that, that things can be good. That things can be different. That the gospel is good news. I don't want to preach in such a way that when people leave there, they feel like it's bad news. And I feel like Jesus is a perfect example of one who... Man, he could say some mighty tough things, some mighty hard things to listen to and to hear, but he always, he always closed out with a message of love and a message of hope and a, a message with a, with a positive uh, ring to it. Well, we've talked about the role of preaching. We've talked about some of the essential elements of preaching. Finally, we want to look at some important admonitions. Number one, under important admonitions, and it's found in verse 5, it says, keep your head in all situations. Probably one of the most important verses that a preacher will ever read. Keep your head in all situations. You see, our tendency is when we run up against certain problems 
or certain difficulties or certain circumstances, situations in our ministry, we lose our heads. Maybe more than one way, but, uh, you know, we, we, we just sort of, you know, we just sort of go berserk. We don't keep our heads in all situations. And uh, what results when you, when you don't keep your head, the results are devastating. For example, uh, the congregation is not growing the way it needs to. Uh, you're disappointed with uh, some of the people in the church. Uh, you haven't seen some fruit in some of your Bible studies. So you get up in the pulpit and you make some overstatements that destroy your credibility. And uh, overstatements can just, can really do that. It can really destroy your credibility. I'm fixing to give one. A guy gets up and he says, you know, uh, the Bible says we must bear fruit. And that if we abide in Christ, we will bear much fruit. Therefore, if you haven't converted somebody in the last six months, I would question whether or not you're even a Christian. That's an overstatement. That's, that's not only an overstatement, that's an absurd statement and a ridiculous statement and the kind of thing that never ought to come out in our preaching. But now, I've made overstatements. Have you ever made any overstatements? I've done that. I, I try not to do that anymore. I think I've learned my lessons on some overstatements that I have made. But don't make overstatements, brothers. You can make your point much better, much more effectively by using good statements that get the message across rather than going so far that you destroy your credibility with an overstatement. It's that, it's that overkill idea that, that really destroys you. And a, a lot of brothers have gotten themselves in real trouble by overstatements. Don't make overstatements that, uh, that take a point too far. You might could say that, uh, brothers, we need to, to reevaluate. Are we really abiding in Christ or not? Uh, when, is the, when is the last time we, we uh, were uh, able to, to lead somebody to Christ? Uh, how much effort are we putting forth in really studying God's Word with people? There are a lot of ways to approach the issue. But uh, don't make those overstatements. Another thing you do when you lose your head is uh, you start taking pot shots at people. And I will be the first one to confess and admit to you that I've done that, but I don't think that preachers ought to do it. Boy, you, you know, you get so put out with some people. So, man, next time you get up in the pulpit, you flat, you know, you lay it on them, and you preach your whole sermon to, to one guy out there in the audience. <laughs> I mean, you don't take pot shots, you just take, uh, you know, uh, you, you, the whole bomb, you know, you just, uh, you just drop the whole thing right on his head. You do everything but call his name when you extend the invitation. <laughs> Brothers, don't take pot shots. Keep your head in all situations. You preach the word. And, and, and preach it to meet the needs of, of the whole congregation. But on personal differences that you have with somebody, go to a man-to-man -man and sit down and talk about those differences. And say, brother, uh, I've got a problem here. Uh, I, think that, I think this is wrong. I think, uh, you know, uh, that wasn't good. Or, or I, I don't think you're really doing what... what God says here that we need to be doing. I mean, whatever you got, you know, if you got a personal grievance or a personal difference with somebody, deal with it in a biblical way, but don't get out in the pulpit and take uh, pot shots at the brethren. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't like pot shots taken at me. I've had plenty of them. You know, I've had plenty come in the other direction, so I know what it's like. And, you know, we just don't like that, do we? We just don't like it. Uh, I would much rather somebody just come down, you know, just sit down with me face to face and let's talk about it. If, if they think I've got a problem, you know. Sometimes I've had to do that. Go up to somebody and say, Brother, I perceive you think I've got a problem. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, don't, don't use 
don't use that forum to take pot shots at your elders or at your preachers or at a brother or a sister or any kind of personal grievance. I don't want preachers to do that to me. I don't want elders to do that to me. And I don't want to be guilty of that. I think if you're campus ministry, you get so few opportunities to preach. Usually, uh, I know when I was at Ohio State, I usually tried to right all the wrongs in 45 minutes or less, and uh, I always regretted it. Mm -hmm. I always regret it. In my saner moments, mm -hmm. uh, I regret it. I don't think he means just keep your head. I think he means use your head. Amen. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, when it's all over and the dust is cleared, uh, we'll get back and we'll regret that and uh, we'll have to make our apologies and it will have just destroyed our credibility with our elders or with our minister and and uh, again this is the great patience uh, I think most of those things are done out of desperation and frustration uh, not out of out of a patient attitude and uh, one in which we're really using our heads we must learn to use the our emotions properly and that certainly there's time for righteous indignation but there's no place to just get up in the pulpit and, and get mad at everybody and, and become angry and just, just blow everybody out the back doors, you see. And, and again, that is a temptation when you're frustrated to just get up there and just, you know, decimate instead of great patience, careful instruction, sound doctrine. Keep your head in all situations. Um, brothers... Wow, I hate to have to make this point right now because I've got so much more to say, but uh, stay within your time limit. Uh, <laughs> really, you know, uh, it's inconsiderate, it's an imposition, it's, uh, it's not thoughtful, it's really not effective to just, you know, go on and on and on. Uh, say what you got to say and say it, and sit down. And, and, and so many times, you know, as, as Steve said, you feel like, man, this is the only chance I'm going to get, and you try to get everything you can think of that they could ever even possibly want to know into that one sermon. <laughs> and you always live to regret it. If, if you've got any sensibility at all, you always live to regret it. Some of the greatest sermons I've ever heard were just packed into 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Rule Lemons gave a speech at Midwest Seminar, one of the finest speeches I've ever heard, 20 minutes long. 20 minutes long. Uh, con uh, you know, put it in a nutshell. Say what you need to say. But don't, brothers, uh, don't get the reputation of a guy that's going to get up there and keep them for an hour and a half. You know, that type of thing. That's, that's not good. And uh, uh, I, I don't think it's using the head properly because uh, people do have a limited ability to retain uh, their interest and their alertness uh, for uh, a certain period of time. Okay, I'm going to finish it. It says, um, endure hardships. You had to learn that lesson if you're going to be a preacher. You're going to be misunderstood. Your motives are going to be questioned. You're going to be fatigued. You're going to be lonely. You're going to be unfairly criticized at times. You're going to be resented at times. You're going to be persecuted. But he says, you endure hardships. And if there's any lesson I've learned, it's this. Never make any major decisions in the heat of the moment. So many times, you know, I've been ready to resign. I've been ready to quit. But given time to think about it, pray about it, seek counsel and advice, then I change my mind. Don't ever make major decisions in the heat of emotions. You'll always live to regret that when you do it. Uh, give yourself time. It's amazing, you know, I've gone to bed when the whole world seemed to be right on top of me. And you wake up the next morning and you feel better. I've woke up the next morning and I felt worse. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, 
My point is, don't give in to your feelings at times like that. But endure hardships, seek good counsel, advice, and so forth. Uh, jot down 2 Corinthians 1 8, 2 Corinthians 4 1. Talks about relying on God, not on yourself. That's when you learn to do that. Talks about do not lose heart. I, I guess I've had to fight that more than anything else. You just you, you, you just get to the point where you lose heart or you, you want to lose heart or you feel like you're losing heart. And uh, the admonition says, don't lose heart. Things will get better. Things will change. Uh, don't let these situations uh, get the best of you. Um, Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17... And, and I just want to read that right quickly here. He says, Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. Brothers, no substitute for sincerity. Um, sincerity alone is not enough. But there's no substitute for, for sincerity. I've been sincerely right and I've been sincerely wrong. But I've always tried to be sincere. Brothers, be sincere in what you do. Be sincere in what you do. If you're not sincere, then you will, you, you will not have any credibility. Be sincere in what you do. And then it says, do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 16. 1 Thessalonians, the second chapter. Philippians 4, 9. The whole book of, of uh, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. Do the work of an evangelist. Those books tell us not only the personal example that we must set, but the kind of ministry that we're to carry out in a congregation. And then finally, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. There in Acts chapter 20. I wish we had time to read it, but we don't. In Acts chapter 20, Paul uh, talks about his ministry with the church in Ephesus. And he says, I taught you publicly and from house to house. He said, I taught you night and day with tears. He said, I preached to you with humility and with tears. He said, I didn't withhold anything that would be helpful to you. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Acts chapter 20 is an absolute must for us to understand as preachers. Boldness mixed with, with tenderness and warmth and affection. Just look at that. Look at, the, look at the total personality there of a man who could preach it in such a way that he didn't withhold anything that would be helpful, and yet with warmth and with tenderness and tears and affection, passion. Um, along this line, brothers, how we come across to people is very important. And uh, this, is, this is our last point. How we come across is very important. Uh, we have to preach the gospel in the culture that we live in. And that's why I didn't wear a robe here today because people in our culture don't wear long white robes. That's why I didn't wear one today. How you dress is important. Your appearance is important. How you come across is important. And uh, I know that, you know, a lot of times we blow our credibility with people just by our appearance. 
just by the way we look. We just, you know, we, we destroy our credibility. We, we, uh, uh, we just blow it with people. We either look so out of it that, uh, you know, they think, well, that guy doesn't have anything to say to me. Or we go to the opposite extremes. Our mannerisms, you know, I don't want to be known for my mannerisms. Now, all of us have mannerisms that hopefully will help us and enhance our messages. But when our mannerisms become more us than our message, then we've got a problem. Watch your, watch your mannerisms. Uh, give attention to, to your voice, to your diction, to your, uh, the way you present your material. Use good humor without uh, being crass or without being a joke, uh, without coming across as being a, a joke or a person who's not really serious. Uh, use, use good humor. Uh, and, and just... Just try to come across in a way that it conveys what you really are all about and what you really believe in and stand for. Brother, you have any final admonition? Brothers, thank you very much. Appreciate you being here and uh, sort of hot in this room, but you've been very patient. Thank you very much.